one of the things that I was thinking about as I was listening to him talk is, you know, we're not here for an emergency right now. Uh, there aren't blueprints and earthwork going up for a, a 10,000 hog confinement uh, three miles south of town or anything like that. Part of the reason we're here tonight is because there hasn't been much going on lately and we don't want you people to forget about this because it's something that uh, you can get sort of lulled into a sense of security and the work that you people and the JFAN organization and the supporters have done has been significant. We feel that it has helped to prevent a large number of large confinements to come into the community. So that's what we're here for, is to make sure you people know that this is a, this is a, a contest that can be won, and we want to keep you on our side. <clears throat> Now, no one can deny that agriculture is a com key component for Iowa, and not only Iowa, but the entire Midwest, a key component of the economy. But it's the model epitomized by the confined animal feeding operation uh, is one that will, is it, is it one that will continue to sustain rural Iowa as a vibrant and pleasant place to live with an integrated and thriving economy? I don't think so. And our next speaker, John Eichard, will have some interesting insights to that question. Now, I've heard John speak two or three times, and I've always been impressed not only with his knowledge of the subject, but about his passion for rural America. This guy lives, breathes, rural America is everything to him. Uh, I noticed on uh, the other alternative notes that he grew up on a small dairy farm. That's kind of a common theme up here. Francis grew up, who will be speaking later, on a small dairy farm. I grew up on a small dairy farm. John Eichert grew up on a small dairy farm. How many of the rest of you grew up on a small dairy farm? <laughs> if you're from Minnesota and Wisconsin, small dairy farms are kind of like uh, small hog farms in Iowa. They're disappearing. Well, Dr. John Eichert has been an integral part of development of sustainable agriculture in Missouri, implementing a national professional development program while state coordinator of the extension program in sustainable agriculture. His extensive research, he has over 200 publications and four books, includes the impacts of sustainable farming on the quality of life of farm families and rural residents. Dr. Eichert also headed a three-year, five-state research pro project that linked sustainable agriculture and sustainable community developments that was funded by the Kellogg Foundation. John, come up here and give us some inspiration like you usually do. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, be here with you tonight. You know, I, I talk on a lot of different issues. I've been retired about 10 years and has to do with economics and sustainability and development and things of this nature. Uh, so I talk about a lot of things other than CAFOs, and I'll tell you the truth that talking about CAFOs and industrial agriculture is certainly not one of my favorite things that I do. The reason for that, even though I've, I've met with groups in 16 states and three provinces of Canada on this issue, is that the reason it's not one of my favorite things to do is almost always whenever I'm invited in, it's a community that's confronted with the immediacy of, of being challenged with large-scale confinement corporate animal operations that are trying to come into their community and they're trying to figure out what to do about it. But tonight it's a different situation because you've confronted this some time ago and you're well organized and you've done the things that other communities need to, to learn from you and I can assure you that I'll pass on the experiences here to other places that I have an opportunity to go in the future. But this issue is ever-evolving. It's always changing. The overall risk, and I'm going to talk more about industrial agriculture in general, is certainly not going to go away anytime soon. And although on the CAFO issue we're not winning every battle, I think slowly we're winning the war, and slowly we'll win the war against industrial agriculture as well. They, they asked me to talk about the economics of CAFOs and alternatives to CAFOs for the future. 
But I think to understand the economics of CAFOs, you need to understand that CAFOs are kind of the epitome of in industrial agriculture, if you will. And if you look at the economic impacts as well as the social and ecological impacts of CAFOs on rural communities today, you can only understand it within the context of industrial agriculture impacts on communities as well. Now, the agricultural establishment, as I call it, which includes the, most of the agricultural universities and most departments of agriculture, USDA, the big commodity organizations, some farm organizations such as Farm Bureau, the agricultural establishment is always extolling the virtues of industrial agriculture, if not directly, then indirectly, by always bragging about how every generation the American farmers feed more people better at a lower relative share of the consumer's income going toward feed production. But what they never talk about is the, is the fact that, in fact, fewer farmers are feeding more people better, all of the, the people that have been driven off of the land in the process of, of doing that. But they brag about the economic efficiency of agriculture, and in terms of short-run economic efficiency, it certainly has an admirable record. But they never want to talk about the cost, the ecological, the social, or the long-run economic cost. And in the process of industrializing agriculture with the specialization that turned diversified family farming operations independently owned now to large, specialized, corporately controlled operations, they gain the efficiency, but they never want to talk about the cost. And what are the costs? The costs that were born in terms of the social cost of the, the millions, hundreds of thousands, but millions over the years of independent family farmers that have been driven off of the land. They didn't want to go, but they were forced off of it by this relentless drive for ever greater efficiency and productivity out of industrial agriculture. And they don't talk about the cost, the social cost to to rural communities that have withered and died because they were dependent upon those independent family farms, not just for the churches and the school, but for the, the economies on Main Street. But you see, those costs that we're talking about are, are long-run costs, and economic costs, the short-run economic bottom line is what counts, so they don't really count those other costs. Ecological costs are the same sense. They're, they're not counted as economic costs. And only the most diehard of agricultural industrialists will deny the negative impact of industrial agriculture on the degradation of the land and the erosion and the poisoning of the land with agricultural pesticides and other chemicals and the polluting of the air and, and the water with commercial fertilizers and, and biological waste from the large-scale animal feeding operations. But you see, you see, these, these, long, these ecological costs are, are long-run costs, and they can't put a dollar and cent value on them, and so they, they simply don't count them. You see, it makes no economic sense to invest in the long-run social structure of the community. There's no short-run economic payoff. It makes no economic sense to invest in taking care of the land for the benefit of some future generation, and so those are non-economic costs and they simply don't get counted. So what's the basic problem? The basic problem is, is economics is inherently short-term. And I say this is what I call myself as an ordained economist because we turned economics into a religion in this country, but I have all the degrees and I've taught economics in the big institutions and I can tell you that economics is short-run. Why is that? Because economic value is inherently individualistic in nature. In economics, there is no such thing as community or society. It's a collection of, of individuals. And since economic value is inherently individualistic, it's short term because there is absolutely no way you can realize any economic benefit of anything happens after you're dead. <clears throat> And life is inherently uncertain, and none of us know how long we're going to be well and how long we're going to live. And so when we look at things from a purely individual perspective, we put a premium on the present relative to the future, and that's what economics does. And you don't have to take my word for it. That's what interest rates are about. That's the reason 
you have to pay money to someone else so that you can use their money rather than they can use it today, and they have to wait. At a, at a very reasonable market interest rate of 7%, for example, if you have to wait 10 years to get the benefit out of something, it's only worth 50 cents on the dollar today, because if you had 50 cents today and you invested it at 7% compound interest, it'd be worth a dollar 10 years from now. That's the, ec the economy telling you the premium on the short run relative to the long run. So it makes no economic sense to invest on anything for the long run benefit of society. It makes no economic sense to invest in taking care of the natural resource base if the resources, the benefits from those resources would be realized by someone of some future generation. And so they simply don't do it when you focus on the economic bottom line. But if you look at the long run, for example, then you begin to realize that all economic value either comes from nature or it comes from society. The economy itself creates no value. It simply facilitates the process of extracting something useful of economic value either from natural resources or human resources. And if you look at the long run, when all of the usefulness and productivity has been extracted from nature and from society, there's no place else to get any more economic value. And from everything we know about how nature works and how society works, economics is simply too short-sighted to ensure that anyone of any future generation is going to have a civil society to live in or is going to have sufficient natural or human resources to even meet their basic needs for food, clothing, and shelter. I can't tell you how quickly we're going to use it all up, but if we continue to be the direction that we go in, if we continue to be driven by the short-run economic bottom line as we increasingly are in this country and even around the world, I can tell you that that kind of society and that side of economy quite simply is not sustainable. And CAFOs are the epitome of that lack of sustainability. You know, if we look at CAFOs when they're coming in to communities around the country, they're always promised that these are going to bring great economic benefits. Practically every argument in favor of CAFOs is an economic argument. But if you look around at the history and what actually happens in those communities, those economic promises are, are never fulfilled. They may bring profits for a few individual short-run investors in the community, but the profits go to very few. And they never result in long-run economic development for the community as a whole. When they come in and build the operations, they don't buy the products that they're, even that they're building with from local people. They buy it wherever they can get the best deal. Increasingly, that's from somewhere other than the local area. And they create a few jobs, but they're basically low-paying jobs, so they end up adding relatively little to the local tax base. And the CAFOs put demands on roads that rural roads and bridges are not inclined to, are not built to withstand. And by the time they pay, they extra cost of rebuilding and repairing roads and bridges, there's nothing really left over to pay for anything else in that area. In addition to that, most of the people that come in and work from CAFOs are not people from the local area. They're, they're immigrants either from other parts of the U.S. or from other countries, and they end up being low-paying jobs. In addition to that, when they come in, they bring the need for public services, for education, for health care, for welfare with them, and all of that comes out of the, the local coffers. And so they don't end up bringing in a net increase in taxes. And beside that, whatever economic benefits are there, most of it's drained off to outside investors rather than staying in the local community. If you want the, the strongest kind of testimonial to the lack of economic payoff, you can't find a, a place anywhere in this country where the CAFOs are a significant part of the local economy that's looked at by other communities as the kind, a model of rural economic development. Most of them are looked at places that were so desperate they had to accept anything, and they say, we sure hope we don't get in that situation. <laughs> Whereas the economic benefits are largely illusion, the social and ecological costs are real. And while these things were debatable for a while, there's no longer any logical reason for denial of those costs. Fifty years of, of economic, social economic studies that have been done on the social and economic 
quality of life in rural communities where we've had industrial agriculture moving in consistently show that the, the quality of life is better socially and economically in communities that are characterized by small, diverse, independent family farms as opposed to large-scale corporate industrial agriculture. Over and over again, you see it. In the cases where you show economic benefits, it's cases where they simply look at the number of jobs created or something of this nature and they ignore the distribution of income and invariably when you have industrialization of agriculture, you have a, the rich get richer and there's more poor people come into the community and the middle class is destroyed and the tax base and the leadership of the community is no longer there. It simply doesn't create the economic benefits that are promised. A 2006 study in North Dakota for the Dwayne Attorney General's Office reviewed 56 studies, socioeconomic studies done over the years. And, and the conclusion of the report after reviewing all of that said that the, the public concerns about industrial agriculture and its negative impacts on rural communities was warranted by the studies, by 50 years of research. And they said those concerns are not being abetted and addressed in rural areas. And in fact, they've become more intense with the realization of the environmental and social problems caused by CAFOs. The economic concerns are also there, to, I mean the environmental concerns are also there today and they're, they're well documented. There are reams of scientific studies today that link the air and water pollution from CAFOs with legitimate public health risk. There are studies documenting the impacts on air and water and soil and food. Contamination with chemicals, disease organisms, antibiotic resistant bacteria, E. coli 157H7. There was a 19, or 2008 study come out that was a two year commission by the, by the Pew Commission that was funded with a prestigious panel of people from all areas of agriculture, public and private. And the conclusion of that report on industrial livestock operations said the, the, the risk to the public are unacceptable risk to public health and to the environment and to the animal welfare. And they said the negative effect of these large-scale industrial operations was simply too great and the evidence was too strong to any longer ignore and that changes need to be made now. This isn't just opinion, this is scientific fact. CAFOs destroy the social and ecological foundation which constitutes the foundation of future prosperity for rural areas. <coughs> In spite of this, people are told that there's no alternative to CAFOs, that we have to have CAFOs not only to feed the population in this country, to, but to feed the world. When they look at things like sustainable agriculture and natural foods and organic, they dismiss that as, as niche markets. Maybe good for a few, but certainly not capable of replacing industrial agriculture. But the reality of the situation is very different from that. What we're seeing today emerge from natural and organic and local foods is the, the beginning of a whole transformation of the entire national and global food system. People are looking for food that has social and ecological integrity. Natural, organic, sustainable, local. This, this is the future of agriculture. Industrial agriculture is of the past. Thank you. Some of the clear evidence that's in statistics, the organic foods have been growing at a rate of t about 20% per year for almost 20 years now. In fact, last year, even in the recession, it grew at 15% per year. That means it's doubling every three or four years in terms of size. And it's not just about people trying to get away from pesticides or chemicals. They're concerned about genetically modified organisms, hormones and antibiotics and E. coli. They're increasingly concerned about issues of obesity and diabetes and heart diseases and other things that are related to, to diet in this country. And the conclusions are reading even with scientific studies that we've created a system that produces a lot of cheap calories, but they're empty calories. And we have a country of people that are overfed and undernourished. 
out here today, and these are growing concerns. They're also concerned about the social and ethical issues and the impacts on farms and the farmlands and the farmers and the way farm animals are treated. They're concerned about leaving a legacy for the future. <coughs> They're looking for a food system that has ecological, social, and economic integrity, so a food system that's sustainable. The latest phase in this whole movement is the local food system, and survey after survey shows that about three-fourths of the people in this country would really prefer to buy food that was produced by local farmers on family farms. They don't trust the corporations, and they don't trust the government. They want to buy their food from somebody they know so they know how it's produced and who produced it so that it has integrity. They're looking for a food system that has social and ecological integrity so they buy it from farmers that they think have integrity, the people that they know and trust. The most promising of all these opportunities that we're talking about tend to be in the animal agriculture sector, whether it's grass-based or free-range or pasture or whatever it is. We had the free-range and pastured poultry come along because food safety and health, but people learned that those chickens really tasted better as well as being treated more humanely than they were in the big factory operations. Had grass-based livestock come along, and it started because it was a lower-cost operation, like my brother, who just retired from our family farm two years ago, switched over to a grass-based operation. He did it primarily on cost, but now we're learning that there's important health benefits associated with meat and milk that comes out of pasture-based operations over the CAFO operations. In addition to that, you don't have to use the hormones and antibiotics, and you can treat the animals humanely. We look about hogs, you have the deep bedded systems in addition to the pastured systems, and Iowa State University did research that showed that, that the cost were just as low and they were just as efficient in the hoop house system. It just took more farmers to produce it because they're more management intensive. Grass-based dairy is growing, one of the most fast, fastest growing operations in the country and one of the most profitable, and Francis Tickey is going to talk some about that, and regardless of these products, if you go into on-farm processing, direct marketing, the profits are even greater and the benefits are even greater for the consumers because you're developing relationships between the consumer, the consumer and the farmer, and that's one of the things that we're looking for, and one of the things we need is to rebuild the relationship of people to each other through the farmer and relationships with the land. And contrary to the, what the critics say, sustainable agriculture can produce just as much or more per acre than you can in the other the industrial operations, whether you're talking about natural or organic or, or sustainable or, or whatever low input. It just requires more management. You have to have farmers who understand nature so they can work in harmony with nature. They have to understand people so they can work in harmony with their customers. You have to have farmers that are more imaginative and creative, that care about land and people. But what's wrong with having more thinking, caring farmers? That's all it takes to feed the world. And if we look out a few years in the future, the things that gave industrial agriculture its short-run economic advantage will be disappearing as the cost of fossil energy goes up and the availability comes down. And as we finally address the environmental issues such as greenhouse gases and emissions from agriculture, those are the characteristics of the industrial agriculture, not sustainable agriculture. And over time, the economic advantage, even in the short run of industrial agriculture, will diminish. The economic advantage of industrial agriculture will increase as more farmers learn how to do it. Ag sustainable agriculture for the future is not just an alternative. It's not an option. It is an absolute necessity if we're to sustain human life on Earth. And just to summarize very briefly, industrial agriculture is supported by an economic illusion of cheap food. You see, food isn't really cheap that you buy at Walmart or buy in the grocery stores today. When you go there and you buy there, it says the people that buy there are just in a position to avoid paying the full cost of food. 
Some of the costs that we don't pay in the grocery store are paid by family farmers who don't get a decent return on what they do and can't afford really to take the care of the land. And the farmers that are forced to the edge of bankruptcy are out of business as a consequence of having to compete with that low, low cost food. And it's being paid by the people of rural communities that have seen their communities wither and die and their families moved away. But it's being paid today by the, the farm workers that are being exploited in the fields of, of California and Florida and places all across this country because they find themselves in a situation where they're so desperate for work, they will accept almost any wage and any working condition is being paid by people that lack the economic and political power to protect themselves from the exploitation of the rich and the powerful politically and economically. And a big cost of the price that we're not paying or the cost that we're not paying for, for our food is being put on a credit card to be billed to our children and our children's children because when the food that we buy is, is made cheap by the exploitation of the land and the degradation of productivity and the, and the pollution of nature, we are destroying the future food supply of our children and our children's children and those of future generations through environmental and social degradation. We're just not paying the cost, but someone will have to sometime. And those people of future generations, they can't express their preferences at the ballot box and they can't compete in the marketplace and they're depending upon us to take care of the land and to take care of society so they'll have something to eat. People in rural communities are faced with important choices today. Many rural communities today, in fact most of them are still places that have clean air and clean water and open spaces and scenic spaces and still relatively quiet and peaceful and have privacy and a sense of belonging and, and a sense of caring and safety and security is still there. But folks, even in rural America, these things are becoming increasingly scarce and therefore increasingly valued. Time is running out, but there's still time. There's time for people in rural community to to stand up and reclaim the right to protect their community from industrial agriculture and its economic and social exploitation. The time is running out, but we still have time to confront the economic reality and to choose the sustainable alternative and to reject industrial agriculture. The time is here today to, to create communities where our children and our children's children will choose to live here and can have an opportunity to flourish in these rural communities. But time is running out. The time is here today, but it's running out. But the time is here to, to free ourselves from the short-run economic self-interest and to make the investments in the long-run future of rural communities. Thank you very much. Thank you.